Hodges and I are pretty excited to do this uh, kind of virtual surgery and, and really a live surgery, essentially, uh, though it's a cadaver, uh, to really show you how this uh, unique system works. We're really excited to be um, using this Lapafu system already, and I, th I think it's going to really simplify uh, uh, a very, can be complex surgery sometimes, uh, really improve outcomes for your patients as well. Um, so the, um, uh, the Lapafu system, obviously, uh, this is a right medical product. Uh, Dr. Hodges, uh, Davis, and myself are both consultants, uh, so I did want to just uh, disclose that. Um, the Lapafu system, uh, we're really excited about it because I think it really hits three key features that uh, we've always been looking for um, in dealing with lapis procedures for many years now. Uh, obviously, we're all aware of the triplane correction that needs to occur and many of the money deformities, and this allows that to be addressed uh, very easily and rapidly. Another key feature is that we preserve first metatarsal length. and We really know that that's critical because um, if you're taking large wedge, re wedge resections out of first metatarsal, you could really change the anatomy quite drastically, leading to overload systems of the lesser metatarsals, et cetera. Uh, we wanted something that was predictable, that you could dial in that correction in three planes when you needed it. Obviously, not everybody's pronated, uh, not everybody's uh, dorsal flex, so you can really dial this in correction so it's customized to your patient's condition. And then, uh, obviously, we want to have better outcomes, improve, improve fusion rates, and uh, very low recurrence rates. And I think when you hit all those, this is why we love doing laptop procedures. We find that it's very reproducible uh, and very reliable, and even more so now with this system in place too. Uh, so I'll take you through just a little kind of cartoon, cartoon schematic <clears throat> of the different steps the, that, the, uh, that we've kind of outlined on doing the technique. Some of these we've already done a little bit ahead of time so that uh, we can uh, save the time for the actual uh, useful parts of the technique for the cadaver. But uh, we've kind of broken it out into, into six steps. Obviously, the different incisions, uh, we'll, we'll go through that quickly when we get to Hodges in the lab. But we typically are using a medial approach incision to the first MTP joint, a dorsal medial incision to the first TMT joint, and then an inner space incision uh, when you need it um, to do a distal soft tissue release for the sesamoid contractures. Um, we'll then uh, have a little distractor device that we can use for joint preparation, and we'll go over a, a very innovative joint preparation kit um, that we have available as well. Uh, and then we're going to apply this uh, uh, reduction clamp as such uh, at the MTP joint level. Uh, and we'll go through the, how we can use that to do triplane tri correction and really be hands off after that's applied. Uh, we'll then take you through a lag compression screw uh, insertion. Uh, we really feel that compression across the joint fusion is important. And we'll show you this uh, technique that we've been using for many years that uses the stability of the second cuneiform as an anchor point. Um, and then after that, uh, we will then apply the uh, plate. There's actually two different plate types uh, or uh, uh, shapes that we could use for this uh, technique. And then there's an optional um, secondary screw that we can go between the first and second metatarsal bases. So that's kind of the six kind of key steps. We'll go through those uh, in the lab uh, so you can see how nicely this uh, system uh, helps you do this you know, by yourself without a lot of assistance. Um, so I think the next we'll go to the lab with uh, Dr. Davis. So you can see I've already made the incision. I've, I've made the uh, dorsal web space incision. I've released the sesamoid metatarsal joint. And, uh, and that allows me to bring this patient with the bunion over past neutral. That's all you need to do with the web space incision. I like a V to Y capsular incision, but I think if you wanted to do a straight uh, medial that would be fine also and then this is a longer incision than we normally would make but for the purposes of this illustration um, we'll make the dorsal medial incision I'll be right next to the EHL so so we will show you the joint uh, and you can see that and then I will use a pen from the distraction device I usually will start in the cuneiform and it is a threaded uh, 2.4 pin, 2.5 pin, and then I'll drop this distraction device, which is in the set. This is part of the set. I'll drop it straight down on the pin. 
And now I will guarantee that these pins are parallel, which is important as you'll see when we do the correction. So the second one goes in the metatarsal. And then I distract the joint. Now once I've distracted the joint, I, all I have to do is use this, these joint um, preparation tools. So this, this, it looks like a chisel and that's kind of, kind of how it acts. And you can see how when I'm in the joint, it just peels the cartilage off. And that's all you really need to do is, is get the distraction and then peel the cartilage off. And you can see how quickly I'm able to take all the cartilage off from, from the joint because it's so nicely distracted. So a couple of things I wanted to uh, point out there real quick. So that a uh, couple of key points, how you put that distractor on, like you made a big uh, point about keeping the pins parallel, cause that's going to be a reference for you later on. But also, you know, I like, you, you can actually use the distractor as a soft tissue retraction device too. So the EHL and your soft tissue is actually pushed out of the way by the, by the uh, distractor. And you always want to put the distractor going lateral on the foot like he has. So you have all that working room coming from the dorsal and medial side and, and the handles of the distractor are always lateral. So that's just kind of a key uh, thing that really lets you get into the joint quickly. And then just wanted to point out the, the little um, cartilage resection tool that you showed. Again, those are sterile packs, so they're, they're razor sharp every time. You're not getting an osteotome that's been used to take out broken hardware from your partner you know, three cases earlier. Uh, so it's really, really sharp. You can see how very quickly you can prepare the joint here. This takes like 30 seconds um, and, uh, and you're, you're down to subchondral bone and ready to start uh, prepping if, you, if, uh, if you're ready for it. Um, yeah, you're going to show the little curette here. And this is really nice. It's a very sharp uh, curette. And we use this a lot kind of on the rim. Um, so, you know, you use the, the first kind of chisel looking thing to take the majority, maybe 80, 90% of the cartilage right off. And then, I, then we use this um, little ring curette, it almost looks like a cup. Uh, so that way you can get right around the inferior rim uh, you're, you're being safe with the plantar soft tissues that way, but you're still removing all the cartilage. And like I said, it's very rapid. You know, you're essentially ready um, to start prepping the, the bone in, in about 20 or 30 seconds. Dr. Heyer? Yeah. We've we got a question online. I'll, I'll throw this one out to you as Dr. Davis is working there. Uh, so this, this is one of our questions from one of the attendees. So if you're not doing a medial eminence resection, do you need the yeah. distal medial incision? Well, yeah, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna use the reduction clamp, uh, we haven't shown that be placed on yet. Um, that that does go over a pin uh, that's based on the on the medial first metatarsal head. Um, so I think at the very least, um, I don't know. We haven't really tried it percutaneous. I would just be a little worried if we just did it percutaneous with the wire. Um, we just had to have to look at that, and make sure that that's not gonna you know, traction on the skin too much. So um, if you're not making a medial eminence resection, I think at the very least, you'd want to make a little tiny stab incision on the medial first metatarsal head. That way you could have the pin in there for the reduction clamp that wouldn't be tractioning on the skin too roughly. Chris, I, I have done it without the pin, uh, without okay. doing a medial eminence. You okay. can absolutely do it. Okay. Um, I like to do a minimal medial eminence resection because I think the capsule sticks down there and, uh, and that gives you some added advantages. Yeah, so you can I agree. see I've, I've, I've fenestrated, perforated the, um, the subchondral bone and you see how I allowed all of the, um, the, the slurry from that to go into the joint. Yep. In addition, in most cases, I'll use a little calf bone graft um, yep. in, this, in this area. Yeah, and the other point I would say is, you know, since we're not, the question I always get is, well, how are you going to get, how are you going to get IM correction, reducing the IM angle if you're not taking out a wedge of bone? And I just wanted to point out, like, when you're drilling and you're doing your fish scaling on that lateral half of the joint, you, you can actually be a little more aggressive on that lateral half of the joint, so you're kind of pulverizing uh, that, that bone into autograph, but also that allows that reduction 
your correct that I am angle and it just kind of sinks right into itself without having to remove a uh, volume of bone. Say it again. Just a reminder for all of our participants, if you have any questions, feel free to put in your questions to the question and answer button that's on the bottom of your screen. I'll be happy to facilitate those where it's appropriate. Yeah, so here you're, you're seeing, uh, you know, obviously he's got the, the larger pins you're seeing are just from the distractor. Um, and now he's, he's placing this uh, guide wire for the reduction clamp uh, pretty much central to the first metatarsal head medially. Uh, and the, but you can angle this kind of targeting towards the second metatarsal. I guess, Hodges, speak to kind of the dorsiflexion, plantar flexion angle of that wire yeah. too. If you, if you need to dorsiflex or plantar flex, you can, if you want to plantar flex it, you can put it a little more dorsal. If you want to dorsiflex, you can put it a little more plantar. We usually put it right in the center and you can see, I like to do it perpendicular to the second metatarsal. And, uh, and that allows me to get this correction that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. so, so now you see where we are, and now I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put the, the clamp on. So the first thing I do is put the clamp around the second, and I typically come underneath the EDL. And yeah, you can so see how that is. It's got a little hook, it's got a little kind of foot to it. I don't know if that's, if that's projecting really well. Um, so that really kind of wraps right around the second met and there's a little kind of uh, door stop to the top of it. So it, you really kind of sink it right down onto the second met um, so that it can grab that metatarsal as a good fulcrum. Okay, so once I've got it going down, before I, I really push this tight, um, I will, I will do my first move, which is, which is the derotation. So I take the big pins and I, and I, and I rotate them. So and you can see that. So now I've got, I've got the joint derotated. If you don't do flat cuts, if you, if you keep the, uh, the joints like they are, you cannot over reduce this. It gets it right where you need to be from a sesamoid standpoint. And once I've got that, then all I do is just close down the IM angle uh, with my fingers. Can you hold that for me, George, so I can, yeah. And so I close down the IM angle with my fingers and it clicks to, to the point where you've got it, you've got it clicked. So those of, I don't know, those that are watching, if you've used the Liz Frank uh, clamp, uh, from another set with right, it has a similar kind of uh, ratcheting mechanism along that that black arm there on the top. That rotation that he showed you, you can see what he's already done with the rotation because the pins are not in angle and are not in line any longer. But that rotation can really occur across that arc that you see that the the, the pin for at the first metatarsal head. You could even rotate it there as well because that's that's a free motion in the frontal plane. So you can rotate that pin at the first metatarsal head. And you'll see, um, you know, kind of where that goes as well. So there's there's that kind of distal mechanism, and or you can use it, you know, use those larger pins to kind of see, actually make it rotate, but also see where the rotation's gone because now they're off plane. And once you once you've got it where you want, you tighten it down, mm -hmm. and then I'll I'll go over and I'll get an X-ray just because I want to see where the sesamoids are and where the IM angle is. Let's take a look. Okay, I'm, I'm fighting the cadaver reality, but you can see the derotation already because the sesamoids look better. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the central arm of the reduction clamp is radiolucent, like you can see. So right now we've got a little bit of the clamp in the blocking the, the sesamoids a little bit on the view, but if you just angle the uh, tube head and come from the top of it, you'll see it. Um, but yeah, you can see you've got very parallel metatarsals right away. So to your point, you can almost, Arthur. it's almost, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's very difficult to get a negative angle because you're leaving some of that architecture of the bone proximally. I mean, you still want to make sure you don't. And I always take this x-ray too, just to make sure I'm not overcorrecting. but. Then you, then you can cut, cut this pin flush because it, if not, it gets in your way of your compressions. 
compression pin. So that's how we are now. We're now derotated. Everything is good position. Obviously, I'm fighting a little cadaver um, issue, but, uh, but that's just because things are a little stiff. And the next thing I'm going to do is we're going to, we're going to, we have a little guide for this, uh, this compression screw. Dr. Davis, as you get ready to do the, the lag screw, can you speak a little bit to how you can reposition that clamp while it's holding, it's holding the reduction at the same time when you're doing your flora, can you speak to how you can move that out of the way so you have better visibility of the sesamoid position? Because I know the, where you're yeah, at yeah. now, so it's kind of hard to see that. See that? So what you can do is you can, you can move it, it, it rotates, or you can move the, the foot up. Let's take a look. Yeah, so even if you just angle the two pad, yeah, there you go. You just angle just the two pad so you come at a little bit of a diff move different angle. Foot up. Yeah. And you can see how the IM angle is, is down. So what's nice about this is that you're, it's totally hands-free right now. The reduction, the alignment, it's being held the entire time where you want it. So you could, yeah, you could take a million x-rays here. You know, you're not worried about, you know, losing your reduction or that, or, or that you're not, you know, having an assistant hold it exactly right. It's, it's locked and loaded now. Now it's just, it's just time to start putting fixation in. Yeah. With great. the view that you have now, are you able to take a more uh, sesamoid axial view? Uh, I, I don't re you routinely do that. Chris, do you routinely take a sesamoid axial view? No, it's kind of a it's kind of a tough shot with a patient on a table. You know, when we do those sesamoid axial views in the office, they're standing up typically and uh, they make that shot. I mean you could do it. I use a mini fluoro, so I'd have to I'd have to take the foot off the side of the bed and then bring it bring it down. I mean you could do it. I don't typically do it. I I take this shot like you see here and um, you can see that they're reduced. So this is the uh, lag screw uh, targeting guide um, that uh, is another optional, you know, something that can help you out. So it's, you're basically using this kind of, you know, goalpost type of split the uprights type of guide. Yeah, yeah. So the two tall wires you see there, the longer K wires, they're in a little targeting guide. They're not actually in the bone, they're above it. Um, I'm sure you can see that on the clinical picture. Uh, and so you basically, he's just going to basically split the uprights with the guide wire for the screw. And we're, we're, we're trying to go across the first TMT joint. You're going to get through the majority of the joint, like you see here. And it's really aiming for the middle of the second cuneiform, just proximal to the second TMT joint. Um, so not going through the second TMT. Yeah. There you go. And what you'll find for those that haven't done this shot before, um, even in really soft bone, even when you have an older person and, and, um, and, and you see they really off soft bone when you're taking the first TMT down, uh, that second cuneiform tends to be very robust. So you really get a really solid landing point for this compression screw to hit. So guys, just a, a question there as, you, as you're looking at those flora images. Also want to ask you just, uh, just a little bit about the step you were on just a minute ago as you're looking at the clamp. Um, how do you prevent dorsiflexion, plantar flexion when you're clamping down on the reduction clamp? Well, it's going, it's going to plantar flex to some degree. That's the third, um, the third, pull this forward to uh, That's the third uh, tri of the triplane correction because typically uh, that's the instability is, is the other piece. Yeah, so you want a little bit of compression. So what I, you know, so he was, Dr. Davis kind of talked about if you angle the wire up or down when you're in the middle of the, when you're coming from the medial first metatarsal, that'll direct the clamp a little bit at a more dorsal to plantar direction. I usually keep it pretty flat, but what I do is I, when I, as I start to compress the clamp, I actually maximally dorsiflex the great toe, and I kind of drive the metatarsal back, which helps it compress a little bit, but that pushes it down a little bit too. So we, you know, we want it, you definitely don't want a dorsiflex lapidus. Um, that's probably one of the worst complications. So we want it to plantar flex a bit. Most of these people have medial common instability, so you want it to plantar flex. Uh, so I just, I, I just kind of drive the metatarsal down a little bit as I'm clamping the clamp and then it's, then it's held. Okay. 
No, you got got the hand drum. All right. So this is uh this is a uh, uh the compression screws um or uh, four o uh, compression screws that are they come in the tray as well. Um, so this will be the first screw that we place in. And again, you're going to get nice compression through the first TMT joint, and it gives you even a little bit of a lag effect, you know, bringing the first ray over to the second ray a little bit because you're going into the second caneiform. Uh, as Hodges said earlier, I, I autographed every one of these lapidus. So we always get a little bone graft from the calc, and we kind of pack that into that lateral part of the first TMT joint because I want to get a little spot weld around at the second met. Uh, adjacent second met there too, if I can. Um, so we'll have some bone graft in there. Um, and then we'll get the threads of the 4.0. Um, I usually countersink this screw a little bit so it's so it's not proud at all. And we'll get the threads of the 4.0 screw fully into the second canadian form. Dr. Heyer, I got a couple of questions I want to throw your way mm -hmm. related to throwing that screw. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a need to transpose the metatarsal plantarly on the cuneiform to any extent, or since this is the length sparring, is that not needed? No, I mean it, it will do it naturally a little bit. So when you when you when you when you get the first screw in, you'll see. You can even see on this picture here. There's a slight, maybe two millimeter, one millimeter translation of the of from the first met base to the to the medial cuneiform, and that's going to come when you plantar flex the mat just a little bit. So there'll be this little slight plantar translation. Uh, I don't want to see some massive, you know, five millimeter step, but you should see, you know, a, a one to two millimeter slight translation there. And um, the other thing I want to point out with Hodges, uh, t the screw he threw here is, is perfect. Uh, I hate, hate to tell him that sometimes, but it's a perfect shot. <laughs> and uh, it starts, you know, it starts right at the kind of the 50 yard line. So if you look at the metatarsal from top down, Kind of right at the right at the middle of the shaft, and then it's aiming at a slight upward trajectory because the second caneiform again kind of sits at the top of the arch. So you don't want it to be totally flat, or you know, if anybody airballs, they usually go under the second caneiform. This is a perfect shot, the slight down to up shot, and then it lands right in the second caneiform. And and I'm so, did you you could feel it so, even in a cadaver it had pretty good bite. Yeah, yeah, and and. There's just a little step off. So because of this, I'm going to use the two millimeter and I'm going to, I'm going to do a one to two screw on this. So I'm okay. going to use the one with, with just a little peg. Yeah. You have uh, all of our. Yeah. And Dr. Davis, yeah. let me throw a few questions your way um, before we yeah. stick the plate on there that I think will help answer a few of the questions we're getting because we're getting some great questions. So when you throw that compression screw across the first met to the middle cuneiform, does that cause any pain for the patient post-op when they start to weight bear? With your experience. Uh, one, that bone can be a little soft. You can, you can, uh, you can actually, um, it's, it's in a, a non weight bearing part of the, of the joint. So rarely do we ever have issues with it. I mean, Chris, yeah. you showed me this technique years ago and I've been using it now for years. And I, I mean, I can't say I've never taken one of those out, but it's pretty rare for me yeah, to do it's that. Pretty rare. It's, a, it's a very stable, um, so if you, I, you should countersink it a little bit so you don't feel it immediately. But I guess the question is maybe because it's going to the second cuneiform and a, and a little bit across that intertarsal joint, does that somehow, somehow hurt? And I would tell you never. Uh, I really, uh, I've, I've never, I've seen maybe one screw over 10 years break there and that was a non-union. Uh, but it's not like a syndesmosis. It doesn't, it's not under a lot of load. Once it fuses, it's, it's, it's a stable screw. So. Uh, it's not a it's not a routine hardware removal. So, uh, Chris, I've, I've put the two millimeter step off, and the reason I like a two millimeter is that's where it fits, and I don't have to remove any of the bone. In addition, when I compress it, it compresses it longitudinally. Right. So this is what it looks like clinically, and then on X-ray. So there is, is the option. Of, there is the option of just a flat plate without the step. So some people do just take a rongeur and kind of smooth off the step off and then just put a flat plate. So there's that option too. Uh, but then you can see this is the, the plate. Um, is it a kind of a dorsal medial type of uh, alignment here? Dr. Heyer, can you speak about the threads of that lag screw? 
should they be in the intracaneiform joint or buried into the intermediate cuneiform? Yeah, I, I typically go for it to be all in the intermediate cuneiform. Occasionally, you might have one thread or something uh, that might be a little coming into the joint. Uh, I don't know that that really matters. I, I, the thread, the thread length on the screw is short enough. You should be able to get them all in there. Uh, typically, the le you know it's a very it's an interesting. This anatomy is pretty consistent on everybody. So this screw is usually in my hands like a 38 to 42 length almost every time. Um, and when you're at that at that starting point where Hodges is, um, so you shouldn't have a lot of threads going through the staying in the joint. They could all be buried in the decanter form. So Chris, uh, I start with the the locking screw proximally, mm -hmm. and I'm only going to put one in, and then I'll then I'll do a non-locking. Um, so there is, yeah, there is there's a, a compression slot, uh, a ramped slot in the plate that if you wanted to use a non-locking screw, you could get additional compression through the plate, which is what yeah. he's doing here. Ideally, this is a bicortical screw when you throw this one, uh, so it has a better, uh, better purchase in the bone and doesn't just cut out as you compress. Um, Twenty. Yeah, and these are three five uh, locking or non-locking. And, you know, the nice thing is once the compression, once the, the clamp is on, this is all just about, about um, putting in the screws. Um, yeah, I do, so I do leave the clamp on like you're doing, too. I think that just continues to maintain your position until you've got the construct really locked in. Once you get screws on either side of the plate, it's pretty much set. You could take the, the clamp off. But I, I would recommend leaving on like you're doing here while you're getting the hardware in. Yeah, Dr. So Hire, what are your thoughts on, on the position of the plate? Um, what if you uh, a surgeon likes to go more more uh, medial with it, for example? Yeah, you can. You can go more medial. Now he used he used a plate that has a medial tab. Uh, I don't know if that was kind of clear. So he's he's putting it a little more dorsal because he's going to actually shoot a screw from medial to lateral to the second metatarsal using the plate for that. Um, but if you wanted to be more medial. You don't necessarily. You could use the plate that doesn't have the medial tab, um, and then the only. And what I typically do, because I, I put mine maybe a little bit more medial as well, and you'll just kind of basically put the plate around the screw head that's of the 4.0 that's already in there. So I kind of tuck it into the side of, right next to the plate, and then I put the plate there. Uh, you just don't want it to be irritating the EHL, so not too dorsal uh, is probably what we've learned. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna use the the tab. Um, I'm, I'm like Chris, I don't decide to do a one, two screw until after I put the plate on, but, yeah. but if you put it on every time, the tab really can be helpful. And, so the, um, yeah, this screw is really, is a nice add. I think if you have somebody that's really, really sloppy, hypermobile, um, you know, somebody that you, you know, had a really large deformity, uh, we've been using this kind of technique for the last uh, two years or so. Uh, it's a it's a very proximal screw. We don't want it up into the mid shaft. Um, you know, we want it to stay kind of proximal to the proximal third. And the the angle of the screw, as you see, the plate kind of drives it for you. But if you did it freehand for some reason, you're pretty much paralleling the first TMT joint. So it's a very 90 degree looking screw, um, and it's going right into the second metatarsal. Um, some sometimes what we'll do is to kind of test if we need this screw is this is where you could take the clamp off and say, Hey, is this really robust enough? Or do I still see a little bit of instability between the first and second mets? And you'll, that we've learned over the years, we all have had lapiduses that solidly fuse hundred percent and yet they still get a little bounce back of IM angle. You know, where does that come from? And we're really kind of learning that there's some instability between um, the first and second columns. And so if you get this, one, two screw is what we call it. Um, you really lock that down and, and uh, you really, it, it, you're really very protective against recurrence um, with this shot. So Dr. Heyer, you know, clearly there's, there's some hardware there and then you've got a couple screws going on. Any issues with uh, the screws interfering with each other? Or do you have a sequence that you use that helps um, ensure that that goes smoothly? Yeah, so I do, I just do it, I do it the exact, sequence that uh, Hodges did here. We get the first lag screw in first. Uh, I actually leave, when I have the lag screw in, I actually leave the wire sticking out a little bit. 
uh, out of the head, out of the head of the screw. So I kind of know where to put the plate. So I, I, you know, once I kind of see where that the wire is going, I know where the screw is underneath me and I can just kind of adjust the plate forward or backwards. So I know I'm, I'm going to have the lag screw just right underneath it and not in the way of the, of the, of the locking screws. The other advantage here is these are variable angle locking screws. So, you know, we all know with locking screws, you don't have to be bicortical for them to work well. And this has a variable angle. So for some reason, if you, you know, drilled using the fixed angled guide and you hit the screw underneath, you know, you could always go variable angle or even go as a shorter screw. So it really is a, a huge advantage over, uh, you know, only fixed angled plates where you really can't move around hardware then you're, you're kind of stuck. Yeah, great. So another question for you, Dr. Heyer, um, when you're throwing that, that uh, inner cuneiform screw, any concern violating the Liz Frank ligament? Uh, no, um, I mean, you're, you're probably going to go in through it, but uh, the one, two screw, you wouldn't really be going through it. It would be, um, I guess there, there's a chance if you're really aggressive with the resection, um, uh, you could, you could un destabilize the Liz Frank, I guess, but you're having hardware then across it. You were actually reducing very similar to Liz Frank. Yeah, and, and the Liz Liss, the Liss Franks is really a Liz Franks complex. You know, yeah. I think that probably is a single Liz Franks ligament. I don't know that that's not significant, but but it's really a complex. And unless there's a real injury, um, I don't think you'll violate that. I think that if there is a innate instability, which many of these folks have, that's the, that's the reason to, to put the screw across. I mean, Chris, we've talked about that before. They, oh, yeah. They've got just a little bit of laxity, which is why you're doing a lapidus in the first place okay. in many and ways. You, and you can kind of see on the CRM picture here, uh, if you guys can see that, you have this kind of kissing between the lateral base of the first mass and the second, the immediate side of the second and ideally, if we get a little spot weld there, and that's where we've kind of packed some of the bone graft, you get a little spot weld there, that really is another source of fixation. It's another point of stability. Um, and I, I think that, for me, has been very predictive of long-term success on the lapidus. If I get a weld right there, they just can't recur. I mean, it's just, it's just impossible. Um, so the other thing I was going to um, um, say here with the... Um, with the one, two screw is, um, you know, if you're using the plate like Hodges did, uh, you know, the, the tab is going to, is going to tell you where to, where to shoot that screw. So, uh, you can, again, variable angle out of that one a little bit too. So for some reason, if you were hitting the, the first four O screw, you could probably go above or below it, but you could also go freehand. I mean, I, I, I use a cannulated screw there sometimes and outside of the tab, if I run into a screw for some reason, um, I'll use a cannulated screw and then just go next to the plate and then get to the second mat. So there, there's a lot of freedom there if you need to, um, if for some reason you're just having one of those days and you keep running into hardware, but typically it's not a problem. Yeah, I agree. My, that's been my experience also. Um, the tab plate is helpful, um, but you, do, you don't absolutely need to do it. And if you decide to do it late, it gives you in many ways more options with that screw. Mm -hmm. So I usually will put all the screws in and then it's not unusual that I'll take this compression screw out once I'm done. And the reason is, is that uh, because it's, it's a little off axis and it's on, it's on a sled, uh, sometimes it's more prominent. And so once I've get, got all the locking screws, which sit very flush on this very thin plate, if this is prominent at all, I'll take the compression screw out. Yeah, okay. And then it gives you even more room to uh, to put that one to two screw. Yeah, that's a good point because that that screw is bicortical, so that is one that you could run into maybe. But um, yeah, that's a good point. You don't really need it, and once the plate's locked, it's done its job. Yeah, yeah. So at at this point, Chris, what I typically will do is do just a minimal bunionectomy, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes on X-ray, it doesn't even look like you need need to do a bunionectomy because of the, the correction. Yeah. I think, it, I think it's yeah. a really good point you're yeah. making. Yeah. It hardly looks like you need to do a bunionectomy, but I typically will do a minimal bunionectomy um, purely because it'll, it'll kind of stick the, the capsule down. 
Yeah. And so, um, so I will, uh, I will just do, okay, go right there, George, this one. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think it's a really good point. If you are going to do a medial eminence resection, do it at the end like this, uh, because you know, you get such, you get such a big correction with this procedure that a lot of what you would have resected, uh, you don't need to resect because it's actually re the joints reduced again. So wait to take your bone. Um, you know, I, I, I flatten it off with just a feather when I put the pin in just so I have a flat surface, but, uh, I, I wait to take the, any kind of medial resection until now, just like you're doing. Yeah. You just wait till the end. And I, th I think, What's happened is my varus has gone down substantially because my medial eminence resection is substantially smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And so, so that's kind of where we are. Um, we're now, what about Aikens? Uh, Chris, what's your philosophy on adding an Aiken to this? Uh, I have a pretty low threshold. Um, I, I usually, when I book a lapidus, I always kind of book possible, like possible Aiken. I wait, I wait till this step right here to decide and I, and I do it solely off the clinical position of the toe. I don't even really look at the x-ray. I just kind of look at the toe. I sit to the side of the bed. I look, I look from the patient's knee down the leg, look at the foot. I want to have the patient's view of the toe and I want that toe to look, um, you know, I want, want the toe to look straight because clearly the MTP joint here is perfect. It's reduced, but if distally to that, if there's still a little interphalangist deformity, um, I think patients are just happier when the toe is straight. So I'll just do a little oblique type of cut uh, on, a, on an Aiken and with a single headless screw and it doesn't have 10 minutes to the case. Yeah, my, my philosophy is, is I think about it, I probably should do it. Yeah. And I've never regretted doing it. Um, I have regretted not doing it. Yeah. So I, I usually will see if the, if the space is not here and I don't close the capsule tight. I don't believe that yeah. you're gonna get benefits by closing the capsule tight other than stiffness. And yeah. once I close the capsule, if I don't have this space that you're seeing yeah. here, then, then I often will just add an Aiken. If it's like this, yeah. Yeah. then I'll just add an Aiken. Even though I think the joints reduce and I've corrected my, my three planes of deformity, um, yeah. adding the Aiken just really doesn't, uh, doesn't take much. And, um, and so I do it, I do it probably over half the time. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Davis? Yes. Can you speak a little bit to compression and gapping? Uh, if some is acceptable, you know, what's your objective there and how does the compression screw and the one, two screw play into that? Well, so if you look where the compression screw is, it's going to compress the central to lateral portion of the joint. And, and, I wouldn't call it gapping. I would call it when you, when you rotate the joint over, there's, there is a little space. And so after the compression screw is in, I will stick a freer in there. And if the freer doesn't continue to go in, if it, if it's clearly stopped, then that's, then that's where I stop. Now I will say I'm, I'm like Chris, I will add graft to every one of these patients, whether it's calc bone graft, or whether it's some some type of, of putty before I do the correction and the compression. And yeah, yeah. and with that, I mean my my union rate, my non union rate has gone down to to virtually none because of that. Yeah. And it, Dr. Agreed. Davis, as you're doing that, as you're taking the calcaneal bone graft, what is your process for doing that? Do you have to take multiple passes or do you have a system that just allows you to to take it and begin using it? Yeah, I use a, 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 a reamer system for bone graft, and, uh, and I typically will go, um, hold that, George. So if you're, if you're gonna do a, um, 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 so this is if I'm gonna do a calc fracture, I'll, I'll do this if I'm gonna do an extensile exposure, and I know that there's, the sural nerve is out of the way, and so I'll go right here, I use an eight millimeter um, reamer and I'll ream typically one pass you need uh, a thimble full is all the bone you need yeah I was gonna say back to the idea about the gapping thing I almost never see gapping there immediately and I think yeah. the point I would want to make there is that when you prep the joint you know we got the cartilage out 
flush that out, then you use the drill bit and you do it aggressively on both sides. I usually come back in there with the, with the osteotome and, and kind of connect the dots a little bit and break it all apart. It's, it's so pulverized in there that when you then do the reduction in the compression, it, it all just kind of amalgamates together. You don't really see, I think if you're seeing a lot of medial gapping, then there's probably subchondral bone plate that's still intact and you're pivoting off of it. So I would really stress that, you know, that it, the joint should be really aggressively prepared and it, it kind of just sinks into itself. Uh, I haven't really found that I've, I've had uh, any problems with a big gap medial on x-ray. It just doesn't seem to happen. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Heyer, for that answer. Uh, I know you guys are wanting to show some cases. Um, let me ask you one more question because I was kind of watching the time as you were working through the procedure. Um, I think I saw about 35 minutes on the clock as you progressed through it. Can you speak to a little bit about how long the procedure takes you as you're working with different patients? Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, I, I typically have the hardware in um, in less than 40 minutes, yeah. 35 to 40 minutes. And then it's just, do I do an Aiken? Do I not? Do I do a soft tissue balancing? Uh, but um, I, I schedule these for one hour. Um, rarely am I still there at one hour. And that's with the wounds closed and all of that. I mean, Chris, are you about the same? Not faster, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, about the same. I'd say about the same. I mean, it, you're pretty much, uh, the bulk of the procedure is done in 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, you know, the nice thing about the reduction clamp, again, or, you know, it's, it's holding all that for you as you're putting your hardware in. You know, that, that screw, the little targeting guide that you, that you use for the lag screw. I mean, you could shoot that screw freehand, it, but it's, it's, it's a little tricky of an angle if you're not used to it. And so that little guide just makes it very easy to take one shot and you're done. So all that stuff just really adds to this chipping away time, chipping away time. And you're not, you know, you're not even having to go back and forth to the x-ray a lot. Because once you've locked that guide down, uh, the reduction clamp down, it's set. So you're not really having to keep going back to the x-ray a million times because now you're just kind of going through the motions of getting the hardware in. So, yeah, this is routinely uh, under a 45-minute, usually around a 30-minute case. I do the same thing. I book an hour. We take a little bit more time on the closure. I do all subcuticular stitches for the closure. So that takes a little bit more time. But... Uh, the cosmesis of that is, is really nice. So Yeah, I mean, it's an hour with the closure. Um, yeah. And I, I feel the same way. It's, um, it really, really does work. And, uh, and, and the, everything is in the tray, which is, which is really, when we set out to design this, we really wanted to, um, to see that, that, that when you have the tray with you, everything is there, everything you need. Um, and, uh, and that, that makes it a self-contained system, so you don't have to pull stuff from other systems, which is what we were doing before. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, those are great. I mean, I think that that was really good to see it on the, on the cadaver. That cadaver had a bunion too, which was nice. Uh, you could really see how it works and, and dials things in. Um, only, the only little caveat I would say is, uh, you know, that I do a little different is the capsule warfy. Uh, I just do like a, me a small medial ellipse uh, something I learned learned from uh, Wild Senior, uh, and the idea, just to, what you said, um, Hodges, about not really over constraining the medial capsule. You do this kind of midline ellipse of the capsule, it allows you to take some redundancy out, so you can you can rotate the sesamoids around the metatarsal head if needed, but you're not cranking down on the capsule like we used to get from like inverted L's and T's. So. You know, you're not using the capsule to straighten the toe. The toe is going to be perfectly straight as you get to the capsule or closure. You're just maybe uh, taking out any redundancy or getting assessments or anything. Chris, so. if, we, if we learned anything in, in learning to derotate the metatarsal, and I think, you know, we, we did it to some degree, but we're so much more intentional about it now. And because of that, we used to think that we had to tighten the capsule to bring the sesamoids around. In fact, we now know that we can bring the metatarsal around and the sesamoids follow the metatarsal. And so the capsular is really just to kind of stick it down. Yeah, and so I was going to make that point too on the distal soft tissue release that you did. So that was the interspace incision. Um, and I'd say on most of my lapiduses, I'm doing that and sit doing a release there. Not all, but a lot of them, because a lot of them tend to be more significant deformities like you see here. 
And again, that release, I think you and I do it the same way, is you're just kind of releasing the suspensory ligament of the lateral sesamoid uh, because it's kind of contracted and stuck up onto the side of the metatarsal there. So you're not doing adductor releases anymore. Um, you know, that really seems to contribute to varus. You're just kind of releasing that suspensory ligament because you want that sesamoid sling to be able to move independent of the metatarsal head as, as you're getting thing around. Yeah. So you want, you want to tell us about this case? This is a great oh, yeah. case. Yeah, yeah. So this is a case of mine. Um, I think she's about late 40s, 50s, I think, if I remember right. Um, previous, obviously, it had a bunionectomy done at some point uh, in the past, and it recurred. And really challenging foot because she had a, a very hypermobile first ray, probably why the bunion came back in the first place number one. Uh, so she had a lot of overload pain at sub two and three, which I think we all see uh, fairly often when you have first ray ins instability or insufficiency. Uh, but then the other challenge is she had this brachy metatarsal, uh, you know, short metatarsal on the third, on the fourth, um, which really, again, kind of, you know, was, was a little bit of a balancing act when you're thinking about metatarsal parabola and the length of that. So um, this was, I thought, a little bit of a, a unique one because I also, I also had a pretty long first metatarsal to deal with. So, you know, I spent all the time at the beginning of this lecture, uh, this webinar saying we want to preserve metatarsal length, which I would say 99% of the time is the case. Uh, but this is probably the one time I thought, hey, well, actually, you know, length is the problem here or part of the problem. So uh, we actually, I actually did a wedge cut on this one, um, which Wright does have a wedge cut guide uh, that'll be part of the set when you need it. Uh, very simple, kind of drops into the joint and you kind of line it down the first metatarsal and x-ray, very simple to use. Uh, and in this case, that was, uh, I think, ideal because I had actually too much metatarsal length. Uh, so we used that, swung it around, used, used the, uh, the compression clamp that you saw, derotated it. And then once we got the, meta, the first metatarsal length set, then we did uh, double cut, what I call double cut while osteotomies on the second and third. So that's a way to kind of shorten them and then not overly plantar flex them, you kind of lift them a little bit uh, with a Taylor's bunion as well. So really kind of trying to balance that cascade around. You see with the system, um, this is all the steps Hodges just kind of took you through. There was the lag screw first. That's the more of the uh, anatomic plate that kind of wraps around the dorsal medial part of the first metatarsal. And then you can see the one, two screw there. Um, I like to use a fully threaded screw there. So that one was a cannulated screw. Uh, not the plate screw, but you can use, uh, again, the plate screw through the medial plate if you wanted to. Um, so again, this lady really hypermobile. Um, you can see that gapping, you know, between one and two. She had recurrence already of a bunion. So if somebody has a bunion recurrence and they're coming to me, they're, they're going to get the kitchen sink because we don't want to be another, you know, two-time loser. So she got all the fixation and then we threw the Aiken in there for, uh, you know, the bells and whistles. So really happy. She was blown away on how well her foot did. Um, really healed it up and she's active she's a tennis player everything else so it was some it was one of the reasons she held off of having surgery for a long time was that she was worried she wouldn't be able to get back to, to activities dr higher yeah in, in this instance or and maybe others and, and perhaps dr davis can speak to this as well but a little bit about post-op protocol and um, just we had the question around construct stability so maybe you can put that all in context yeah sure um, so this is a type two anodized plate, which is a much stronger type of titanium. Uh, we've been we've been early weight bearing lapidus as Hodges and I have in our in our collective groups for a long time as we as we adopted locked plating into into lapidus fusion years ago. So we already knew that that would that would work uh, well. Um, and so that's the same here. I think when I have especially when I have the one two screw in there, this construct is rock solid. Now, I still don't have them weight bearing out of the OR, and, and the reason for that is more the soft tissues. Um, I feel like if I can make them baby it for a little bit, get the swelling down quickly, they're gonna have less stiffness, they're gonna, get, they're gonna bounce back and, and get into shoes a lot quicker. So I have them in a Jones dressing uh, with a polar pack for the first week, non-weight bearing. Then at week one, I put them into a boot walker. Uh, I start doing ace bandages around the toe on week one. Uh, and they can take the boot off the shower, get the incisions wet. They start doing some gentle range of motion at the toe at one week. I have them heel weight bear in the boot for one week, and then they can go into weight bearing as tolerated in the boot. Um, we do that for a total of five to six weeks. So I, I see them back at three weeks, get another x-ray. I see them at another 
at six weeks, get another x-ray. I try to get him to shoes at the sixth week. Uh, Hodges, is that similar to you? I know you're, you've been pretty Yeah, I'll go, I'll, I'll go heel weight bearing for the first 10 days, which I really encourage them to keep it up and elevated. Then I check the wounds, and then I'll do uh, a little soft removable wrap with a short boot, full weight bearing at 10 days, and out of the boot at six weeks, just like you. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, I, the, the deal is I try not to treat these patients like midfoot fusion patients. I treat them like bunion patients. So I don't put them in a splint. I don't put them in a cast. I think that this, this construct uh, allows you not to have to do that. And, uh, and, and they certainly appreciate it. Well, and your point earlier too, I mean, on, honestly, the non-union rate with this construct, I mean, it's, it's as close to zero as you can get. I mean, it's really, uh, I haven't seen, I can't even think of an onion that I've had. The other nice thing, you know, even before we started kind of doing the one, two screw, you know, even just with a lock plate and a compression screw there, even if you did get an onion, uh, they're usually totally asymptomatic because the, the struck, the construct's so strong. So, you know, I wouldn't tell somebody at one week, Hey, you know, yeah, go, go roller skating. You know, I mean, it's still surgery. It's still bone. It's still need, It's still a body that needs to heal but it, it's not a six weeks in a cast. That's just, that. there's just no point of that. I agree. So doctors, the system itself is really designed to preserve length of the first ray. So mm -hmm. it really, it, you know, the desire is to prevent future metatarsalgia of the lesser toes. But in the instances where you have to do something with shortening lesser toes, what, what is your, you know, how do you approach that? And what's your, what is your approach? Well, this this case here, I had to shorten. I mean, so this case, you're not seeing the right off post op. This is when she's healed. But um, you know, I I did. You know, we shortened through the second and third metatarsals with the wilds. As I said, I did kind of double cut. So when you, if you have to shorten back a decent amount, you also want to lift up because otherwise you'll get two plantar flex. But then we also did you know hammer toe corrections on her. You know, so she she we shortened kind of everything to make them back together. Um, it's not uncommon to have to do something to the second metatarsal a plantar plate a while, you know, for these people that have been chronically overloading due to the unstable first ray. Um, my, my order of procedures to do all the bunion work, all the first TMT work first in the case, because I don't want to have a clamp around where I'm doing a while. Um, and then, you know, get all the lapidus part done. And then if I have lesser toe stuff, then I go do lesser toes, at the, you know, the same surgery, but I do that subsequent. Yeah, and I'm I'm the same way. I think proximal to distal, medial to lateral, is yep. is kind of a fundamental. You got to have medial column inst uh, stability before you start messing with the lateral columns. If I'm going to do a gastroc, which some of these need gastrocs or a, a displacement osteotomy because they've got a flat foot, um, I the the I did I did two this week, and the first one was on a patient that I did a total ankle on. So, you know, it, that's not uncommon for me to stabilize the TMT and a total ankle with a bunion. And uh, I do everything proximal before I do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then mini fluoro most of the time, right? You know, you're, you're not using yeah, big. I use yeah. mini fluoro. Obviously, if I'm doing a total ankle, I have a big fluoro. So I, uh, I'll have it in the room. But it's so much easier to do mini fluoro because you can control it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, great job. Scott, any other questions? I think that's good. I want to give you just a minute to share any concluding thoughts before I wind things down for us. We've had a lot of great discussion and some good interaction. So I, I appreciate all the participation and questions that have come through and yeah. guys have done so a great job would, answering them. What I would say is that, uh, is this is, this is part of the evolution, right? Our evolution, like 28 years of doing bunion surgery, the evolution for me has been dramatic. And, um, and years ago, I, I decided that in big bunions, the lapidus was definitely the way to go. And, and as we evolved to understanding rotation and understanding three planes of correction, um, it, it became very clear that we needed to make it simpler and more intentional. And, and so as we designed this system, uh, that was the goal, to make it easy for you so that you can do a lapidus and know that 
your results are going to be as consistent as your Austin's and the patients that are appropriate for Austin's. And you don't have to push the limits of distal osteotomies or even scarves because, because the lapidus is too difficult. Um, and I really believe that this is part of that evolution. And, um, and, I, and in my hands, this has become uh, such a reproducible operation uh, with all the things that, that we showed you tonight. So um, for me, this is, I, I believe that this will be my final evolution on, uh, on lapidus. Chris? Yeah, no, I would agree. I, I, I think it's, um, you know, lapidus for me is, is my number one procedure for bunions. It really is uh, because it is so reproducible. It is so uh, long lasting. I don't have to worry about recurrence. Um, and as I do with sometimes with distal osteotomy. So uh, for me, it's replaced a lot of osteotomy work. I, I, I hardly do any proximal osteotomies anymore. Um, and I, you know, I do some distal ones when they're very minimal bunions, but, you know, lapidus worked really, really well, even when it's not some, you know, 25 degree IM angle. I mean, it doesn't have to be the world's worst bunion to do lapidus. Um, and you know, I think we were really conservative with it in the past because the recovery time was so long or fixation, you know, the non-union rate was 15%. Those, those have all changed. And so, you know, people are now are, you know, we're weight bearing them at a week, uh, pretty regularly. Uh, they're not in a cast for six weeks. Um, and it's such a versatile procedure. You can do the one that's really crazy rotated, huge IM angle, or you can do the one that's, a, you know, medium, you know, medium one that maybe you would have done a scarf on or whatever. And for me, I'm out of the room a lot faster with higher satisfaction rate with a lapidus than I am with a scarf.